Hello, everybody. Sammy Delati here, senior editor for the magazine Antiques, and I'm going to be going over TAFAF, New York, which is currently up at the Park Avenue Armory. <coughs> and so a little bit of background about TAFAF, for those of you who are not familiar, it stands for the uh, European Fine Art Fair, uh, started in Maastricht, Netherlands in 1988. In 2016, opened two editions in New York, a fall edition and a spring edition split between antiques and modern art. Those two have since been combined into one spring fair uh, covering you know, contemporary art, modern art, design, uh, antiques, and it is on view uh, until Tuesday, again, at the Park Avenue Armory. Um, I am unable to go uh, because I'm in Mexico, as those of you who have watched streams should know. Um, but my editor, Greg Sirio, was on the floor yesterday during the press preview. And he and I have come up with a few uh, highlights to share with all of you who either perhaps are planning to go on the fair Going, go to the fair this weekend or are, like me, unable to go because of geographic restrictions. <coughs> Excuse me. So I will add the presentation now. And as you can see, this is, well, maybe you're not familiar with this artist, but this is Ella Anatsui. James Gardner wrote a short front book article about this African artist uh, a few issues ago. Uh, this is at Friedman Benda, one of the first pieces you see when you enter the show. Um, and so let's get into it. This piece is by Alighiero Boetti. It's a, it's a Torna Buoni art. Um, it's an embroidery from 1989. Uh, Boetti liked to incorporate uh, these grids of uh, block letters. Um, I, I suppose it's a form of, um, uh, excuse me, not a form of, uh, anyway, I like to incorporate a grid of um, block letters whose meanings were hard to decipher. And this was his way of playing with order and disorder. <clears throat> this is actually a, a photograph uh, taken by Greg. Uh, this was a piece that struck him especially. Um, and I, I think it's interesting too, that the, aside from being a mishmash of letters, not forming words or anything like that, um, with Arabic letters interspersed as well as, uh, uh, the Roman alphabet, um, the way the, the letters are composed on their patches with dark, um, backgrounds breaks down the letters themselves into abstract designs. I'd like to know uh, what maybe a Chinese speaker or someone who didn't use the Roman alphabet or the Arabic uh, would think of this sort of design uh, because I start looking at the U's as arches um, and the O's as you know holes as opposed to uh, me uh, units of meaning. Um, which which kind of adds to the uh, the effect of the piece uh, that well, what he is is after. Um, okay, a new exhibitor at the fair is Valois, um, and this is a Jean Dunand lacquered screen from around 1930 in a Cubist style, also with gold leaf. Um, Dunand learned how to lacquer from the Japanese master uh, Saizo Sugawara. Uh, Sugawara was a modernist artist in Japan, um, and obviously drawing upon the uh, the rich history of of lacquering, rich tradition of lacquering in Japan, uh, used both for uh, furniture and for works of art. Um, moving on, this is by Bruce Nauman, and I lit upon it because, of course, I'm most familiar with uh, stills from Nauman's performance pieces from the 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, and with his, uh, neon works, uh, neon light works. Um, but these, these hands, um, this one in particular is called proof for hand circle. It's from 1996. Um, 
were cast from Nauman's own hands. And I don't know, I guess it's from, it's from a period in Nauman's career that I'm far less familiar with, uh, but it's a, it's a beautiful as well as cheeky object. Um, of course, uh, cheekiness was uh, part and parcel with anything that Nauman produced. Um, if I didn't mention this, this is at Peter Freeman. Okay, moving along. Uh, I love this piece. This is at Modernity Stockholm. It's by the OG Danish designer, Kara Klint, 1916. Um, you can sort of see the, uh, the germ of Danish modernism in this piece's clean lines. But what stood out to me were the details on the feet and below the... Um, you know, what would you call it? The, uh, the cornice below the armrest. And those details taken together with the massing of the piece recall for me something like empire style, of course, not with the, uh, with the leather cushions, but the, the Lux woodwork and just the blocky, um, almost, you know, I, I get almost an Egyptian vibe. Um, from some of the massing here. And of course, uh, empire style was uh, the style derived under Napoleon after his conquest of Egypt. Just a really cool piece from 1916, prescient, um, but also looking at the past. Um, and here is another fine work of furniture. This is by Gio Ponti, uh, that, that's sort of in the same vein. Uh, it's from considerably later, 1951, uh, low table being shown at Jeffrey Diner Gallery. Uh, which is also a new exhibitor at the show. And uh, interesting point, the image on the right, uh, so when you plug images into PowerPoint, which is what I've done to make this presentation, then it, uh, it, it like writes out some, I can't remember what you call this, uh, alt text um, describing the image. It just gives you like a suggestion for what you could write <coughs> uh, to describe the image. And it identified the image on the right as an astronomical object, which, you know, fair enough, it looks like Jupiter or maybe the moon. Um, but it's actually uh, burr walnut and painted wood. I'm not actually sure which part of the piece is burr walnut and which part is painted wood. Um, I guess it would make sense that the top were burr and the legs perhaps were painted wood to match because it might be hard to get that sort of consistent design out of a burl, um, uh, along with uh, brass hardware. Uh, but it has a very simple and elegant modern profile, in my view. I mean, nobody would mistake this as anything but mid-century modern. But the luxurious wood being used, um, again, you know, recalls the past. Uh, and you know, this sort of work, and I guess specifically the woodwork of other Italian designers of the time, uh, serves to remind me, at least, of wood culture's uh, importance in a pre-plastic Europe. Um, wood essentially was plastic. You know, use a classical definition of the term. It was moldable, uh, carvable. Uh, it was... Um, filled with these swirling colors, potentially, um, of course, far greater range in plastic materials. But for thousands of years, uh, European culture was taken by the possibilities that inhered in, in woodworking. Of course, uh, Europe was deforested over the time, over the last two or 3,000 years. Um, and so the, the absence of wood uh, available uh, dovetail very nicely with the advent of the plastic age. But I thought this was a, a really, a really nice throwback and sort of a thought piece for, um, for, uh, for that development in Europe. Okay, moving along. So this is a piece at Jackson design design also based in Stockholm. It's an, uh, Ingegerd Torum chest of drawers from the 1930s. Her career, um, as it might be apparent, intersected with Bauhaus. Uh, and so there's this uh, very interesting constructivist design on the drawer faces. And 
the designer has taken care to paint even the edges, as you can see in the right image, even the edges of the drawers, so that when the drawers are pulled out, the design uh, maintains its integrity. Uh, yeah, that's all I have to say for this one. All right, so what we're focusing on in this image are the flat and convex mirrors. Uh, this is Gallery Chastel Marichal. Um, these are by Lean Votron from the 1960s. And Lean Votron really hit her stride uh, immediately post war, post World War II, that is, uh, and is known for incorporating uh, really abstruse symbology in her, in her, um, in her works. Of course, these, these, uh, Mirrors are much simpler uh, than those, but I encourage you to go online and look for some some other works by Lean Votron. Um, it kind of in contrast to the piece we looked at earlier by Boetti, the uh, the embroidery. Um, Votron was interested in conveying meaning uh, through her use of symbolism, and she used rebuses, uh, which are pictures in which the objects. Uh, the objects pictured uh, either spell a word or refer to a phrase. Um, one other sort of funny note, I don't know if I can zoom in here. No, I cannot. But if you look at the mirror on the uh, lower right, you can actually see Edgar Greg Serio. Uh, it isn't too much of a fun house image, so I'm not, I'm not, uh, I don't feel bad about pointing that out to viewers. Okay, moving along. So these are, okay, anyone want to guess? You've seen them before. And if you follow the magazine, uh, you've seen one of these, I mean, not one of these pictured, but a work of art from this genre on our cover uh, a few years ago. I want to say 2017, though. I think it was probably, maybe it was 2020. It was like a January, February issue. Um, anyone? Okay, these are Native American ledger drawings. So these were initially encouraged by white settlers um, uh, and then became a source of income for Indian communities, uh, sold to outsiders. And when they, when they were being initially produced pre-1890, they depicted a Plains Indian world that still existed, of course, as we get into the 20th century with uh, the closing of the frontier, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the drawings became um, rather reminiscing about a lost or passing away, a world that was passing away. Um, I would definitely encourage those of you who are unfamiliar or who are familiar and would like to know more about um, ledger art to to, to check out the Plains Indian Ledger Art Project. That's Plains Indian Ledger Art Project online, which has scans of, uh, high res scans of thousands of, uh, of these ledger artworks. And um, there's greater variety than I was initially aware of, like some fairly conventional portraits also make their way into, uh, into the genre. Um, as you can find on the project, uh, instead of these uh, these more naive uh, illustrations of uh, Indian life at the time. Um, okay, moving along. So we are we are about done here. Um, here, I've just got a few kind of fun inclusions for the end of the stream. Um, this is uh, "Cyclist" by Jean Dubuffet. Wow, I really should be better at pronouncing that. Jean Dubuffet whom we all know, hopefully, uh, outsider artist or art brute or whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, uh, booster, very early booster in France. This is actually from 1944, if I'm not wrong. I think I'm not. Waning days of World War II, um, showing that, uh, you know, even in war-torn areas, Life goes on, and so does cycling. Um, this was an uh, applicat prison in Paris. Uh, Gallery showing this piece. Uh, Bernard Goldberg. 
has um, some pretty incredible, incredible works. There's the N.C. Wythe piece on the right, monumental. Um, and then there's also the uh, Winold Rice mural in the oval at left. Uh, Bernard Goldberg is usually right inside the door at TAFAP. Hard to miss. I'm not sure where they are this year. Uh, and that is it for my little rundown. But just to reiterate, um, the show TAFAF is on view at the Park Avenue Armory until next Tuesday, the 16th. So definitely check it out. And if any of you listening would like to uh, get in touch with the magazine, get in touch with me about uh, works you're seeing that you thought were really interesting or that we should know about or whatever else, uh, please reach out. Um, you can email the magazine. You can email me at S Delotti, That's S and then my last name at the magazine antiques.com. You can also, uh, send us things, DM us on Instagram or on Facebook. Um, we'd love to see uh, what everybody else has seen as well. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that I, I couldn't make it this year, but I feel going through some of these works sort of like I was there. You can make me feel even more at home and comfortable and included and assuage my FOMO if you, if you send anything else. So hope you all like the stream, get to the show, and I'll talk to you all later. Over and out.